Kidney disease doesn't discriminate. Finding out that you have it is always a shock. Oh, I thought I was going to die. I, you know, I didn't know anything about the whole journey of dealing with a transplant. That's kidney transplant recipient, Illinois State Senator Christopher Belt. I'm Monica Fox, kidney transplant recipient and director of outreach and government relations for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. On this episode of The Journey Continues, the senator shares how his life challenges have led to impactful work in the community. Senator Belt, how long have you been living with your precious gift? Uh, I have been living with my transplant now, my, as you termed it, my precious gifts. Uh, In January, it was 11 years. I received my kidney on January 24th. 2010. That's wonderful. And as recipients, we never forget that date, do we? It's a special date. We don't. I I actually treat it as a birthday. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Did you receive a living donation or a deceased donor kidney? It was a cadaver kidney. So how'd your journey start? My journey started, uh, interestingly enough, my brother uh, in 1996 was in a house fire. I ran in to get him out and subsequently he was burned, I was burned. And as I was being treated in the hospital, I was told that my kidneys are filled. And so I was dealing with the trauma of being burned over 14% of my body. And then I was told some urologists came to my room and told me my creatine levels were really, really high and don't worry, but take care of this first, get it, get well. And, but when you get out, you need to see a urologist. That started my journey with dealing with kidney disease, being aware of it. It started in June of 1996. We held it steady from June 96 to 2009 is where, when I went on dialysis. How'd you feel when you got that diagnosis? Oh, I thought I was going to die. I, you know, I didn't know anything about the whole journey of dealing with a transplant of kidneys and all of what they entailed. I I was a 24 year old man. I was, you know, I ran every day. I worked out. I played in softball leagues, basketball. I just got married in March of 96. My daughter was due. My first child was due in August of 96. And So I get in a house fire, I get burned in June of 96, and then this is dropped on me. And, you know, I just thought, wow. Yeah, your life was just beginning, and then suddenly you felt like your life was ending. Absolutely. Mm, So you said you went on dialysis in 09. Yes. Before going on dialysis, was there any discussion about getting a transplant? Yes. Over the years from 96 to 2009, As the years progressed and the levels of my kidneys functioning decreased, the frequency of having those conversations increased. And so I became very aware of what that entailed, what it looked like. And so I got mentally prepared and eventually, ultimately it did in in 2009. Did you have any fears or expectations in the beginning of starting dialysis that proved to be different as you went along? I was on that machine Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays for five hours. Nothing quite prepares you for it. (laughs) I didn't know what to expect. I just told myself, whatever it was, I'm going to keep my routine. So I kept going to work and, and I had, I told my wife, let me drive myself to the facility. It was important for me. I kept working out and I, I tried to keep my routine as much as I can, because for me, that was the key to my survival in dealing with going to dialysis. And so while I didn't quite know what to expect, I felt like if I had a a, a strong mental focus, I could get through it. That sounds like it made a lot of sense. And I bet that really helped you. What issues, if any, did you run into while you were on dialysis? After I started dialysizing somewhere a few months later, I started getting tired. My color changed. I got a lot darker. My energy level just started waning. And those are things that I I was running into. 
I don't think of anything beyond those two. I was lethargic a lot. I look back on some pictures that I would be in and my skin color was a lot different. Yes, that is one of the effects of dialysis, as many of us do know. How'd your health impact your family? And you said you had a new wife and a and a baby when you were initially diagnosed. Mm -hmm. How did that impact your family? They really, really just became a support system for me. I, I remember when I would dialysize in the winter, I would drive home and you would be so cold because, you, you know, it would make you cold anyway. It, at least it did for me. And so uh, when I would make it home, the temperatures in my home would be at 85 degrees. And so they sacrificed their comfort. So when I came in, it would it would be relatively comfortable for me until I got in tune and my body got back in tune and then we would turn the thermostat down. But So they made their little adjustments for on behalf of me. I don't think they ever really knew the depths of how tired I was because I kept going. And that was part of the thing that I wanted to do. I understand that I can see as being the the father and the husband, you wanting to be strong and and keep that up for your family. And I, But having their support, I know, was so helpful to you along the way. Family support is critical. It was, it was it, as you stated, it was critical. My wife, my son, my daughter, and then my siblings, my mom and my dad. And so it really was a, a family affair and you get your support from them, you get your strength from them. And, and so those are the things that I remember about the impact that dialysis had on them as well as the strength that they gave me throughout that journey. What was your experience like while you were waiting for a transplant? Did you get worked up for transplant prior to going on dialysis? Not prior to going on dialysis, but I'm blessed in that I, I was only on dialysis for a year. And within that year, I, I received three calls. I was secondary on two. And obviously, I was primary and got the kidney on the, on the last call. So all things considered, I was on for a year. But that within that year, I got three calls. And so that whole process for me, as I stated before, was a blessing because I was actually dialysizing with people younger than I was at the time. And, and they had been in there six, seven years. That sounds like a blessing. Did they have any explanations as to why you were so fortunate to get your transplant so quickly? Most people in Illinois wait five to seven years. I know. I know. I, you know, I never asked. I was just thankful each time I got the phone call. That's wonderful. So I must ask, how's being a transplant recipient changed your outlook on life? You know what, uh, when, when I told myself that when I was dialysizing on those Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays for five hours, that if I ever had the opportunity to get on the other side of being in dialysis, which obviously meant I, if I was fortunate enough to get a transplant, that I would live life to its fullest and that I would do the things that I was procrastinating on doing it because time is... Uh, precious. And, and and so how has it impacted my life afterwards? I've done those things. And, and, you know, I've traveled to places that I've always wanted to go. And I've just, I've lived every single second from transplant to now. And I've tried to squeeze every ounce out of the day. And I've tried to be an advocate for those who are less fortunate, those who are probably dealing with illnesses and sickness. And my outlook has always been the glass is half full, but now it's I'm the most optimistic person in the world. So you are a patient advocate in addition to being an Illinois state senator. I bet that your calls are helpful. How are you received by the patients when you reach out to them? I am I'm received in a in a good positive way. I, I I come to them. I talk to them. I I lift them up. I tell them, hey, look, I was literally sitting where you are, 
when I talk to them, I come from a place of walking in their shoes. And so I get it. And so I'm able to relate to them as opposed to another legislator probably speaking to them, which would be great as well. But if you've never been in that seat, you just don't understand. And so I, I can bring experience when I talk to them and I can tell them what I did. And my goal is to make them feel better about the predicament, even if it's just for that moment. And if I can do that, then I've, I've succeeded in what I, I was trying to do. Thank you for doing that for taking your precious time and doing that. So how has kidney disease shaped your views on healthcare legislation? You know what, again, it, it, it goes back into uh, being uh, empathetic, going back into really, really knowing what it's like to walk in those shoes. You couldn't ask for someone to take the lead more than I do on issues of pre-existing conditions, on issues of doing what's best for those, uh, what the Bible would term as the least of these, or those who need help the most. I am a staunch advocate for that. I, I firmly believe your zip code should not dictate the quality of health care that you get. And so I'm always fighting. I'm always championing those causes for quality health care, no matter who you are or what you are, but particularly for those in underserved communities and those who need it the most. So it sounds like your position as being a state senator is actually affecting the landscape of health care legislation. And I think that's fantastic. I wonder if you think that the availability of government programming or education could help people going through kidney disease and particularly the process of transplantation. Oh, for sure. I've had the pleasure of doing several Zoom town hall with members of clergy. And the idea was to the exposure to educate, to talk about what it entails. If you just, if you don't know, then you don't know. You, It's not going to impact the quality of your life to share an organ that you have two of in general. And if we're in this specific instance, we're talking about kidneys and, you know, you can live with one and, and you can live quite comfortably with one. And so we have those discussions and we educate and we, we try to just raise awareness of the critical need that's out there for more people to volunteer and, and become donors. And so I think the more we educate, the more we dispel the myths and the mis misinformation. And this is why education is important because you're gonna get educated one way or the other. And it's either going to be the misinformation or really the, the, the accurate information. And so we have to counter counterbalance that. And we have to go to stakeholders. Like in, if you're dealing in the black community, you gotta go to the churches. You gotta get to where people have a comfort level and a trust level. And those are the institutions that we try to have conversations with. And, and, and it's important. Trust is so important within the community. And uh, you make a great point about connecting with the trusted organizations in order to raise awareness. That's that's key. How do you think the state legislature can become more informed about issues that impact patients with kidney disease? You know, I, I tell people all the time when I go, especially before COVID, when we could actually meet and you could be up in your in, in, in Springfield and lobbyists come up or, or groups of advocates come up and talk to you. The best way is for legislators to know what's going on is by meeting people and people sharing their stories. We get hit with a lot of, lot of information and we know a little about a lot. But the best people with the information, the most impactful stories come from those advocates who call, who stop by our in-district office, who meet us along the way, or who make a special trip up to Springfield, a busload, and they come in and they tell their stories. And that's the best way to make an impact because each time you have a conversation with a legislator and you tell your story and you tell it from your perspective, then we take that. It's in us. And if you see some legislation that can impact a person, 
off of one of your conver previous conversations with a group or a person, then somehow, in some way, you become an advocate. You become aware and you're like, oh, this is what they were talking about. Oh, this is what this bill does. Oftentimes, I may not know about a bill. And an advocate group, they'll come in and they'll talk to me. And then the first thing I do is pull it up and say, let me get in the weeds on this. Let me get, let me do a deep dive and let me understand what they're talking about. And so I would say continue to advocate, continue to champion, continue to have a voice on those issues that are closest to you. Talk about it. Get to your legislator and, and let them understand why it's important for you and to have this bill either pushed or to have this bill fought against. And so these are the things that we uh, that I look forward to in that interaction when we're in Springfield. So the patient voice is critical and I lead the advocacy efforts at the foundation and due to COVID, like you stated, we haven't been able to come. We in previous years came in bus loads. I'm not sure when we will get back to that in terms of particularly kidney transplant recipients, people with chronic kidney disease traveling together on a bus to come to Springfield. Do you think that roundtable discussions with groups like ours would assist the legislators in gaining uh, knowledge about this information? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. If you were to rank it on the Likert scale and you say, okay, one to five, five being the best, well, that would be in person. Uh, and obviously, we, the five, we can't, we can't do that now. But the four would be uh, having roundtable round table discussions and, and, and still giving information, getting information out there. And one of the things that I always do, I, I'll do it with my kids. I'll do it with people that I encounter on, on roundtables and virtual seminars. I say, once you have the information then it's incumbent upon you to go disseminate it. You know, information is no good staying where it is. And so if we're going to have these roundtable discussions, at the end, my charge and to each and every person on that virtual seminar is to say, now what are you going to do with it? Go out there and spread it so other people can know. And so, again, if five is in person, four and three would be the virtual seminars and workshops and town halls. And, and I would say, I'm all for it. Let's do what we can. You do the best you can with what you have to work with. And right now, the virtual seminars and tours, that's all we got to work with until we're able to get back in face-to-face. All right. That's helpful. Sounds like I'll be coordinating a virtual advocacy day <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and and I'll be asking you to be on our agenda. <laughs> uh, I'll do it. So finally, how about some words of encouragement for people who are listening, who may be traveling along the journey that you've been on? They may have CKD. They may be on dialysis. They may be waiting on transplant or living with transplant. What words of encouragement do you have for them? And what would you say to them about advocating on their own behalf? I would tell them that to, to, to have a positive outlook. My mom used to say, you know, no storm lasts forever. This too shall pass. And I would tell them to maintain a positive outlook and do what they can do on their end. See, when I went through my dialysis, I hit all my benchmarks. I stayed away from the things I was supposed to stay away from whether it was potassium or liquid intake. And I did all the things that I was supposed to do. So I, I held up my end of the bargain. And so I would tell them to do that. And I, I understand they'll get tired some days, figuratively, as well as literally, but maintain and stay the course and believe that your day will come. And, and the mental aspect is about 80 to 90% of that fight. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you do on behalf of all of the residents of Illinois. And thank you for your advocacy on behalf of patients, particularly kidney patients. And thanks for spending this time with me and sharing your journey. Advocating for the health and rights of kidney patients and organ donors is a huge part of what we do at the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. To make your voice heard, visit nkfi.org slash advocacy. At NKFI, prevention is a major part of our mission. That's why at the end of each episode, you will hear a nutrition tip. 
Here's Dr. Melissa Prest. Here's today's nutrition tip about sodium. Our bodies need a small amount of sodium to function, but we typically consume much more than we need. Most of the sodium we consume in our diet is in the form of salt, which is made up of 40% sodium and 60% chloride. The words sodium and salt do not necessarily mean the same thing, but are often used to describe the same concept. For example, on the food label, the word sodium is listed to describe how much sodium is in a food product, while the front of the package may list no salt or low in salt or no added salt. About 70% of the sodium in our diet comes from packaged, highly processed foods and restaurant meals. Too much sodium can increase blood pressure and high blood pressure over time is a risk factor for heart disease and strokes. It's recommended that adults consume less than 2,300 milligrams a day of sodium, which is equal to one teaspoon of salt. Some people may be recommended to consume no more than 1,500 milligrams a day of sodium for some health conditions like high blood pressure or chronic kidney disease. Following a low sodium lifestyle can be made easier by choosing to follow some of the following tips. Check food labels and choose the ones with the lowest amount of sodium per serving. Pick fresh or frozen poultry that has not been injected with the sodium solution. Select condiments with care and choose ones that are reduced or lower in sodium versions. Choose canned vegetables with no added salt and frozen vegetables without salty sauces. If you have to choose a canned vegetable or canned beans with salt, drain and rinse them and you can cut up to 40% of the sodium. Flavor your foods with onion, garlic, herbs, spices, citrus juices and vinegars in place of salt. Ask at the restaurant if the dish can be made without any additional salt to it. And always taste your food before adding any salt. With today's nutrition tip, I'm Melissa Press, a registered dietitian nutritionist and the foundation dietitian for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. The Journey Continues is brought to you by the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois and sponsored by Donate Life Illinois. To learn more about kidney disease and living donation, visit www.nkfi.org. To register to become an eye, tissue, and organ donor, visit lifegoeson.com. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please subscribe to and leave a review for The Journey Continues in Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. This podcast is produced by Rivet. To hear more great podcasts, visit rivet360.com.